Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Teresa Elsie. Uh, Teresa, until very recently, was the uh, Senior Managing Editor Digital at, uh, for Trade uh, Division at Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. Uh, she directed a group that produces and updates more than a thousand ebooks yearly. Yes, you heard that correctly, a thousand ebooks, including adult fiction and nonfiction, culinary and lifestyle, YA titles, picture books, and e only projects. She began her career in print publishing, though she likes ebooks better. And she has also worked uh, at O'Reilly Media, Let's Go, and Cengage. She is currently the managing editor at Bridge International Academy, so give Teresa your. So, we're going to talk today about building ebooks that last. And first, to introduce myself, I am Teresa Elsie, and what I want is to build ebooks that last. Let me tell you about that. Until very recently, I managed the team at Houghton Mifflin Harcourt that produces all of the company's trade ebooks. So, besides our front list production work, we were resp responsible for an active ebook backlist of more than 5,000 titles. As part of that job, I, fe I fielded all the retailer errors, all the customer complaints, all the editorial issues that were generated by those backlist ebooks. And in 2016, I spoke here at eBookCraft about how much time my team was spending on fixing up and reissuing those backlist eBooks, the work of maintaining eBooks that we'd already created. And so now I'm here in 2019 to talk to you about how we're now trying to avoid spending that time, how we've come to realize that it's not sustainable to keep revisiting a large backlist that grows every year, how we've developed a really strong interest in making eBooks that are designed to last, whether that means for two years or five years or 10 years, who knows? And since I've left HMH recently, this idea is even more on my mind. I'm thinking about not anything as grand as like my legacy, but more like how to prevent people who are still at HMH from hating me. <laughs> I'm asking things like, in my time building eBooks at HMH, did I help create something that will last, something that will live longer than the exact team that's there right now, our particular skills, our specific knowledge, our idiosyncratic ways of working? And I think we should all ask, am I making choices that make the work I do sustainable? Am I making choices that won't create intractable problems for the people who will take up the work after me? And a lot of that is building process and good reporting, and some of that is writing documentation. But I think some of that is a particular ethos around how we build the files. And then there's a large part of that that's the digital files themselves, the actual EPUBs or the HTML or the XML files that we're gonna leave behind. And so I've been thinking about how do we set ourselves up so those files will last, at least for a little while, into the indefinite digital future? How do we build ebooks that last? And I want to approach this question mostly pragmatically, based on things like our real experience at HMH of what made eBooks not last, real examples of things that got HMH eBooks removed from sale or sent back to us to fix. But I'll also reach a little bit into the theoretical, looking a little bit at how some of our partners, like libraries and archives, are thinking about preserving our digital work for the much longer term. But to start, why it matters. Before I go much farther with this, I want to give you an idea of what the stakes look like from where I sit, to give you a sort of where I'm coming from before you start subtweeting terrible things about me. <laughs> so I believe that ebook production is a service my team provides, that it's not about showing off our cleverness, or yes, our occasional genius, but it's about helping our authors and artists achieve their vision or communicate their message. And often that involves the reader not noticing the ebook design or package at all, that our work happens so seamlessly that a reader can immerse herself in the story. I believe that most of our work should, rightfully, go unnoticed. I have also experienced that, like copy editors, our work gets noticed only when we fail, and that will come to my attention as something like this. This is the actual Amazon review distribution for a book that HMH published, and people love this book. The 78% of readers who said that this was a five-star book say things like, a new and necessary American voice, a piercingly raw debut, an instant New York Times bestseller, the fiction debut of the year, a major literary debut. And then the one one-star review is, this didn't work when I tried to download it to my Kindle. <laughs> and what you're not seeing here is that this one one-star review was the very first review that this book got the morning of its pub date, because that download failure, that device error, that major UX glitch in your ebook is apparent the second you try to purchase the ebook. So while our print readers are like opening their package and sitting on the couch and slowly reading the book and finishing it and thinking about logging back in to write their review, this is what people are seeing when they come to buy the book. So that was a bad day for my team. That first one-star review hurts print book sales. It's deeply harmful to our author relationships, and it disrupts all our pub date marketing plans. My group will burn so much goodwill when that happens that I'm increasingly reluctant to experiment with anything that has any chance of failing this visibly even if, as in this case, it is not actually our fault. And here again are another couple negative customer reviews for a different ebook, one that we actually ultimately removed from sale at Amazon because our publisher felt 
that these negative ebook reviews were hurting print sales. And the issue here again was not exactly the ebook file quality, but negative reviews specific to the Kindle customer experience, inability to download the Kindle file, the device restrictions not being clear enough. This slide shows an image of a large river in South America. And I don't want to dwell too much on that one certain large Se Seattle based ebook retailer. But the business reality is that we have to care very much about that one company's ability to put quality warnings on our titles, to remove our ebooks from sale, to change the rules about how we do business at a whim. The marketplace we exist in, I think, is one with very little room for error. And whether we like that or not, whether we want to resist that, I think we still have an obligation to publish our author's ebooks as well as possible. So let's talk about why those two ebooks didn't last. As I've alluded to, sometimes these high profile ebook problems happen because of fully preventable errors by my team, but more often a perfect storm like this requires a combination of other factors as well. Some retailer software bugs, poor retailer messaging about the user experience, a distribution infrastructure failure, limitations of the ebook formats available on a particular platform, stubbornness from authors or from retailers about what's going to be the most successful approach for the ebook. But after making a certain number of apologies to authors and editors and entire publicity teams for whom my ebook has ruined their pub date, I began to feel that it was part of my responsibility, like it or not, to make, of what, make what I think of as bulletproof ebooks. Ebooks that are made to conservative standards and tolerances that will withstand whatever the marketplace and your readers will throw at them. Are you reading on a first generation e ink Kindle? Bring it. <laughs> so then we can ask. What causes our ebooks not to last? What causes HMH ebooks to be removed from sale or flagged by retailers for fixes or for whatever reason sent back to my desk to deal with? And while I have some strong impressions about what causes ebooks to fail to last, what causes them to get sent back to my team to work on, in order to bring you science, I went back through a year's worth of emails from our distribution manager at HMH. <laughs> HMH distributes to something like 40 different ebook retailers, so I get a lot of those emails. And emails from our distribution manager to me follow a few basic templates. Teresa, this ebook was rejected by a retailer on delivery. Can your team fix it? Teresa, this ebook has a retailer or customer complaint. Can your team fix it? Teresa, this ebook has been removed from sale by a retailer. Can your team fix it? So I looked at about 100 of these emails, each giving a reason why an ebook couldn't stay on sale and stay on sale, why it needed to come back to my team, and here's what I found. Almost 60% of the issues came up when we delivered old ebook files to new retail partners. Because we can't see the future, we make ebooks that meet the standards of the time, and these, of course, change. But when our strategy team makes a partnership with a new retailer, they will send them our entire back catalog. So it may be 2019, we make a new deal, and a new retailer receives all of our files, going back to ones we built in 2010. And then when they start running them through their validation to put them on sale, some of them do not pass. At HMH, a major problem we have in this category is fixed layout EPUB 2 files that we built for Apple when they were the only retailer taking fixed layout. We converted a lot of children's picture books, our most popular ones, of course, our high priority backlist, to fixed layout EPUB 2, which now fail every time we try to deliver them to a new retailer because, as you know, fixed layout EPUB 2 is not a real thing that EPUB standards know about. <laughs> Um, but a newish problem we see a lot in this category is there was a new EPUB check release, I think it was 4.1.0, that improved URL validation. It would alert you to URLs that had, for instance, spaces in them. That's a great thing. But now when books that were created before we were running that version of EPUB check get submitted to new retailers, we get back errors on any ebooks that have invalid looking URLs in them. And that's what should happen. That's something we should fix. That is a great improvement going forward. Thank you to the EPUB check developers. But it means suddenly, with no notice to us, books from our backlist need to be re-edited. They have suddenly become books that don't last. Um, in order to keep the world from grinding to a halt, our current retail partners grandfather in those old titles. They let us keep selling them, even though they don't meet current standards. They wouldn't pass modern EPUB check or retailer-specific validation. But sometimes our distribution team finds a need to re-deliver our old titles to old partners. And I don't really know why that is. It seems like a lot of distribution problems get solved by the equivalent of like, turning your computer off and turning it back on again. But so this comes up at our established retailers too, that we re-deliver re a file to them and then they reject those older ebooks because they no longer pass their validation and we need to go back and fix them. So that's 60% of the errors. Ebooks that no longer meet modern specifications and standards for ebooks for reasons large and small. And you need to be on top of that by being able to rebuild your ebook files easily, more on that to come. But maybe also just by not being too far ahead of market standards, by being conservative about what you build, especially at moments when new, maybe non-standard formats are proliferating. The next largest slice here, about 20%, are what I identified as retailer or device-specific issues. And about half of those, 10% of the total, 
are about retailers or often just one specific retailer device or platform that is blatantly not supporting something that was correct, something that is in the EPUB spec. And we get files rejected because the retailer doesn't support encrypted fonts. We get files rejected because the retailer's devices can't render SVG images. We get files rejected because they use CSS that's a little too exotic for a particular e-reader. And that's a bummer, but that's one of the reasons that I argue for conservatism in what you're choosing to send. And then the other half of those retailer and device specific issues, another 10% of the total, are us failing to meet a retailer specific requirement or accommodate some quirk of their rendering, like neglecting to update an Apple version number in our metadata, delivering a file or image that exceeds a particular retailer's maximum size guidelines, not including an HTML cover page that's required by platforms that can't display a cover otherwise. Kobo recently told us that the way we designate our spreads in fixed layout eBooks with setting rendition spread to both instead of auto was causing books to display improperly on Android, which is one of their five platforms. And I love Kobo for the way that they make their EPUB spec totally clear and freely available online. They have great documentation. But they're the most recent case of a retailer saying to us, your EPUBs, all of them, or some large set of them, don't work for some very small fraction of our customers. Could you, as a result, revise your entire backlist? And when you distribute to 40 some retailers, that happens with some frequency. In cases like this, sometimes the retailer is correct. Your eBooks could be slightly more standards compliant. Sometimes the retailer is wrong, and they're asking you to break your eBooks in order to accommodate them. And when the eBook works fine on one or most of the retailer's platforms, so it looked fine in our testing, but they found one old corner case platform that it does not work on, that feels like a really small place to start thinking about making changes to your entire backlist of 5,000 books. But again, this to me is an argument for conservatism, for operating somewhere very safely within the boundaries of what the most optimistic read of the standards would allow. So that's 80% of the errors right there. Another 10% or so were legit errors made by my team, which I'm just telling you about to prove that we all make mistakes. Even three times so you think you can code winning teams. <laughs> I went through my Amazon errors separately because there are seven times as many of them. They get their own email folder. They also, can't, they also come with their own error categories. So when I look at 718 issues Amazon reported on HMH titles, the types of errors break down like this. That huge slice at 69% is what Amazon calls typo. And the 7% slice, there's another 7% slice that's punctuation, which I think is typos that involve like periods and commas and stuff. <laughs> so <laughs> a total of about 75% of the errors our largest retailer is reporting to us are about the quality of the content, about the totally non-technical stuff that you are typing between your P tags which I hope is reassuring in saying that the number one thing my team should be doing to improve our ebook longevity at Amazon is not weirdly technical. It is not some perverse product of their upsetting business model. It is not anything you'll have difficulty explaining to your boss's boss. It's just improving the quality of the content. But if I redraw the graph to look at just the 174 remaining errors that weren't typos or punctuation, we can see a few other things pop out. About half the remaining issues are navigation. And that's sometimes an error in a TOC file or an unlinked cross-reference. But I see Melissa shaking her head. The vast, vast, vast majority of those, 85% of those, are link rot. And more to come on that. There are another two big chunks here at about 15% each, which are metadata and formatting, neither of which is exactly what it sounds like. For us, metadata almost always means the ebook is missing a cover. So that's a need to rebuild old files problem for us. We have a lot of old ebooks that didn't have covers. And formatting covers a wide range of sins here, including more typos, errors with line breaks or paragraphing. It often get also gets applied to fixed layout ebooks that don't look good for some reason, issues that are preventing enhanced typesetting for working, or other problems that you generally find in more complex ebook files. So well, what I hope you see here is that the universe of things that can cause retailers to reject our ebooks or remove them from sale is very large. There are a few types of issues that make up the preponderance of the problems. And so with that knowledge, and also with some impressions and prejudice from my experience managing this group, we can then talk about some design and workflow tips for making long-lasting EPUBs. So how do we build EPUBs that will last forever? I think this is it. Just build the simplest EPUB you can stand. If you need more, we could say maybe like, just build the simplest semantic standards compliant EPUB you can stand. But why do I say that? I say that because when I think about ebooks that are going to cause problems, ebooks that are going to boomerang back to my desk again and again and again, I think of ones that look like this. Fixed layout, highly designed, embedded fonts, large trim size, enormous file, or like this, complex layout with enhancements. It's a retailer dependent multi-touch title. And when I think of ebooks that will just work, the ones that will never garner a customer complaint, the ones that will never get sent back to me because a retailer software update breaks them, and that, by the way, these books are going to outsell the other type 10 to 1, or probably 100 to 1. 
I think of ebooks that look like this, the plain old reflowable text. So as a very first suggestion, I would say to you, don't make fixed layout ebooks. You're not gonna listen to me, I don't even listen to me. <laughs> Dave is clapping. The specs people are clapping. The people who have to work in the field are not clapping yet. But as a second offer, I would say, accept that the fixed layout ebook files you make are temporary. I've chatted with people about how do I make my fixed layout ebooks better? How do I make them semantic? How do I make them accessible? How do I make them anything better than that unmanageable div soup that InDesign outputs? Which I think are all really my question. How do I make them to last? And I think, don't bother. Like, accept that today's fixed layout EPUB files are temporary. They are filling an ebook shaped hole in the marketplace that I think probably will not itself last forever once we figure out what the better business model is for selling recipes or blog content or children's picture books. And if you have to build the ebook again someday, you can just re export it again from your InDesign files or however you build these things and use whatever improvements they've built into the export by then. And I say this because at HMH last year, fixed layout ebooks accounted for about 50% of our suppressions and errors. However, they also accounted for about 2% of our sales. Like Nelly, I am not a business analyst, I am not an MBA, but this does not seem like a strong business case to me. And then there's the additional cost and aggravation of actually making these books, which I find can often be 10 times that of a standard reflowable ebook. I know that many of our fixed layout ebooks are causing bad customer experience when they're not being read on the exact combination of device and platform that we plan them for. They're bad for accessibility. They are bad cross-platform. They are bad at the large number of retailers who say they take fixed layout files, but then are not implementing fixed layout reading correctly. So, to turn this into positive advice for you, I would say at very least, don't make ebooks that could or should be reflowable as fixed layout ebooks. Take the time to train your editors, designers, authors about how ebooks should work, about the accessible promise of ebooks. Convince them that pixel perfect fidelity to the print book is not living up to what ebooks can be. That looking at a fixed layout book on an iPhone is a pale imitation of their coffee table book anyway. And that, in my experience, fixed layout is the very first kind of ebook that does not last. Okay. If you hated that a little bit, you're really going to hate this. I, just, I want you to know that I quit my job at HMH to be able to give this talk. <laughs> Don't be cute. I have an incredibly, increasingly incredibly simple aesthetic when it comes to ebooks. Yes, I appreciate a well-designed ebook. I like an ebook that surprises and delights. And even contrary to popular belief, I like drop caps. No. <laughs> I don't, I hate draft caps. <laughs> My experience is that design elements break all of the time, particularly drop caps. I see that in our error reports. Here are a couple screenshots showing drop caps aligned on one platform and misaligned on another. Well, Amazon explains to me why to get drop caps working just for them, just across their platforms, I'm gonna need two sets of styles. And more on why I'm not willing to use media queries to do this in a little bit. I see that in the infuriatingly inconsistent user experience. This is Kindle Look Inside. It's displaying a drop cap, a very bad drop cap, when you look at Look Inside on Firefox. Same book, same Look Inside, no drop cap at all on Chrome. <laughs> what is this? I don't have time for this. You don't have time for this. I don't need to fight with you, though, about drop caps in particular. I believe it if you say to me you have an accessible, semantic, always beautifully aligned, perfectly cross-platform testing way of creating drop caps. But drop caps are a metaphor here. I'm just not convinced that an ebook with a design element that has been proven to be this fragile over and over again is a bulletproof ebook. And I'm not arguing against doing beautiful work or pushing the boundaries of what we think is possible to do. I'm just saying that spreading those experiments randomly through a 5,000 ebook backlist is possibly not the kindest thing you can do for everyone who comes after you. What else? Don't be clever. And I hate to say this to you because there's nothing I like more than a 10-step CSS hack that gives you a double border and relies on the before pseudo element. I myself have fallen prey to saying, let's do poetry line numbers with a CSS counter. But no, save that stuff for the browser. <laughs> My rule of thumb is that if I have to look up how to do something, probably someone else did not bother to look it up and implement it when they were designing the reader software for the obscure phone app that 3% of their one small retailer's customers are using. And that means an ebook is going to come back to me to fix. Here's one of our e-production colleagues reminding us, never do anything clever in Kindle books seems to be the most robust philosophy. <laughs> robust is the goal here, bulletproof. Also, the more brilliant your solution is, the more it is going to hurt when it doesn't work. All right, one more. Actually, just don't use CSS. Okay, you guys know I'm not 100% serious here, but let's hang with us for a sec. The one thing we know is that CSS can hide any number of sins. Here's a sample ebook recipe page, which could be coded with proper semantic elements, as you see on the left, or as we all see, not uncommonly, 
as just a bunch of keys with different class names, as you see on the right. And both of these can work fine if we use CSS to do the hard work of making everything look right. Either one can look like this. And sorry, that's not good CSS, that's just a class demo I pulled into here. But if we look at these samples without their CSS, we can easily see which of these is properly coded and which is not. We can see which of these ebooks is likely to last, to still make sense, and to provide a reasonable user experience, even if it gets separated from some or all of its CSS. Okay, but why are you saying that my ebook might get separated from its CSS? Let's start with accessibility. You're using CSS mostly for visual style, so I know what you're doing is you're creating meaning by the way things look. So we know that meaning isn't accessible to folks who don't see the pages the way you do. We know your CSS isn't used by screen readers or voice devices or in audiobooks or in any non-visual uses of your content. And again, CSS is a way to obscure that you're not coding in the most semantic accessible way or to add additional layers of inaccessibility on top of your content. This is a tweet Katie Mastercola, one of my production editors, pointed me to on that topic. Accessibility is a mindset where you build the basics, HTML first, then try not to destroy the basics with CSS and JavaScript. Why else do I say not to count on your CSS? We've all seen where e-readers accidentally or deliberately are failing to use our CSS. Your style sheet is just one in a stack of competing style sheets, the user agent style sheets, the reader's own preferences. And we know that ebook reader devices can be quite aggressive and probably arbitrary about overriding your CSS. Enhanced typesetting, I think, is the ultimate case of Kindle saying, we believe our design choices are better than and should supersede yours. We know there is or there was an issue on Nook, where if your CSS contained a media query, the Nook completely ignored all CSS after that point in your CSS file. That, by the way, is why I'm not using media queries for drop caps. We know, and apparently even readers know, as this exchange of review comments suggests, that Kindle Look Inside and Kindle Cloud Reader are particularly bad about including all of your CSS when they preview your ebooks to potential customers. So I'm just not confident that every reader in every context is seeing your ebook in all its CSS full glory. And then a third reason that I don't rely on my ebook staying with their CSS is remixing. One of the ways of making your ebooks last is making sure they live up to the full promise of the way ebook content can be reused and repurposed, even outside of the comfy, discreet little ebook package that you've created. So what if your ebook text is included in Buzzbooks, a cross-publisher sampler anthology, or a chapter excerpt is posted to your company website, or several or hundreds of your ebooks have their content extracted for use in a recipe app or in an online learning platform? You can imagine that in many cases, your unique title-specific artisanal CSS is unlikely to go with them. And insisting that that CSS is necessary to understand your content keeps your text from becoming fully part of the digital world. OK, a few more tips. You might not hate these ones. Build every ebook the same way. The experiments and the one-offs and the old tools are what make it very hard to improve your backlist as a whole because every book becomes its own special problem. Uniformity across your backlist is ideal, especially when you're thinking of maintaining and updating it. Once you have a process for building good ebooks, use it consistently. Try not to add customizations at the end either. Katie Mastercola. <laughs> Build just one ebook file for all your retailers. I'm just waving to my team here. All of this will make your life easier when you need to rebuild 1,000 ebooks to meet current standards. You want that process to be as automatable and as low touch as, as possible. Edit source files instead of outputs. Once you have a consistent library of ebooks, you probably want to rebuild them all one day, whether because the industry is moving to EPUB 7 or you just decide there's a better way to build your OPFs or your TOCs or add some better accessibility metadata. If you're starting from finished EPUBs, that will be very annoying. CF updating one single EPUB 2 file to EPUB 3. But if you've made all your edits in an XML file of the text or in the source InDesign file, if you keep your final content at one level of abstraction above the EPUB, you can then use your existing build process when you need to rebuild an ebook or many ebooks to meet whatever that new standard is. Save high quality assets. In terms of future proofing, keep higher res images than you're using now. Keep color images if you're not currently using them. Someday you may need those. I have follow standards here with an asterisk. You should follow standards. Standards are good. We have to believe that the path to making ebooks at last is making them to standards and believe that our platform developers and retailers and the whole ebook ecosystem is committed to standards. Ebooks that follow the EPUB spec are so much more likely to last than ebooks made of proprietary standards. I say that as a person who has a large library of EPUBs. <laughs> Being part of the standards doesn't solve the problem, though. SVG is part of the EPUB spec, yet I've spent a certain amount of time this year wrestling with one retailer who cannot handle one book that we built with one SVG ornament, will not acknowledge that the issue is that they can't deal with SVG, and keeps resending us a 40-page error report that lists every incident of that ornament in the book. And so there are a lot of things that are standards that we're not using yet, things like pop-up footnotes and media queries and SVG, adding metadata that, as far as we know, isn't exposed to readers anywhere and yet may be problematic if wrong. 
Katie Mestercole and I were talking through this one day, and she said to me, I've had enough of armchair standards. And I think that really nicely encapsulates my sense that we're obligated to do what works in the marketplace right now and what we believe will continue to work, which hopefully, but not always, is aligned to standards. And, but overall, I do say, we are, making, we are trying to make our ebooks last for the unpredictable future, and standards are what will take us there. <clears throat> so as we move to a conclusion for this little section, this is a picture of my daughter's stroller. It's stuck on a poorly shoveled sidewalk in Boston last week. And I'm accepting that as my personal karma for every time I have made an ebook with poor accessibility. <laughs> but I come back to accessibility here because a, con a concept that intrigues me is the curb cut effect, the idea that curb cuts benefit not only the people with wheelchairs who originally advocated for them, but many people, including parents with strollers and conference attendees with rolling suitcases. The idea that making changes intended for one particular outcome tend to be much more widely beneficial. And so my thought here is that doing some of these design and workflow things I suggest, even just with the self-interested goal of making ebooks that will last because you don't feel like revisiting and correcting your ebooks over and over again, will also have the unintended effects of making them more accessible, of making them more responsively designed, because the best responsive design is no design at all, making them have better semantics, making them have clean, clear, aesthetically pleasing code. So controversy aside, what I want to say is that I think conservatism in your design also generally makes your ebooks accessible and responsive and semantic, and all the things that we believe are good about ebooks, which is a decent conclusion. And now I want to talk to you about Linkrot specifically, because it makes up such a large portion of our errors, because yesterday Melissa de Jesus told you I was going to give you a solution for it. I did. So. And also I want to talk about it just because I think the 404 page is such a good metaphor for thinking about things that did not last. So one threat to the longevity of our ebooks is link rot, or the disappearance of external websites that our authors cite in their books. And link rot is sort of a hobby of mine. I coordinated an e-production chat about it about a year ago that also drew in some web folks who work on the problem and generated a range of ideas on the topic, which you can read about on EPUB Secrets. But what I'm feeling today at this update is that there do seem to be good solutions for those problems. There do seem to be emerging tools at all points in the production pipeline that can address some of these issues. As an example, I was really pleased to see this Internet Archive blog post from January 2017 called If You See Something, Save Something, which has really simple suggestions for archiving your links using Internet Archive's Wayback Machine. You can, for instance, quickly just install a browser extension that will instantly add websites to Internet Archive and get back a permanent stable URL. So here I am adding the ebook craft page as it appeared on Saturday to Internet Archive's Wayback Machine. You can now find that in their archive. And I'm not one to interfere too much at the authoring stage, but you can imagine a very simple process that you start at your publishing company tomorrow, where you just have your authors or your copy editors install this browser extension, save every page that they cite in their manuscript, and then use the permanent Internet Archive link in the manuscript instead of the original URL. Just a few weeks ago, I learned via a tweet that we live in a world where you can save any web page forever by just typing web.archive.org slash save slash in front of the URL. That's all. That's not hard. Anyway, that's for our authors who should be doing this at the front end. But what happens when they haven't, and we, the ebook developers, get the crumbly old URLs to deal with? When I spoke about maintaining backlist ebooks here in 2016, I used an example book from our backlist, one that had been published in 2014. And like many of HMH's nonfiction titles, it contained numerous hyperlinks, uh, mostly as part of citations in the endnotes. So this particular ebook included 275 linked URLs, and nothing in particular had been done to attempt to preserve them. I tested those URLs with the W3C link checker in 2016, about two years after the pub date, and I found that 47 of them, or 17%, were not working at that point. And now in 2019, four and a half years after the book was published, I retested all the URLs, and this time I found that 58 of them, or 21% of the URLs, were not working. And that's actually great in terms of the gloomiest predictions about link rot. There's an off-cited study that says the average URL has a two-year half-life, and that would predict that as many as 75% of the URLs would be dead at this point. But 21% of the hyperlinks in your ebook being broken is not a good user experience. And it's not good for us as publishers because we've seen retailers suppress or put a quality warning on an ebook because readers have reported as few as two broken links. So then I tried to fix some of these URLs. I worked through 32 of the URLs in the test that had returned 404 errors to see for which of them I could find an archived version of the web page. And to do that, I used a tool called Time Travel by a group called Memento, which searches a large set of web archives. So a, a lot of different web archives are searched by this tool to find previous versions of a given URL. You can give it a date you'd like it to match. So I put in the 2014 pub date of my book to try to find a version of the page that was actually as close as possible to the version my author was looking at when he wrote this book. And of the 32 sites, Time Travel found me at least one archived version of 21 of them. Almost all of them were in Internet Archive. The other archives are quite small compared to Internet Archive. 
And while that's certainly not all of the broken links, being able to replace two-thirds of the broken links in the ebook with links to an archive page seems like an obvious win for user experience. And I do think that dealing with link rot may require a don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good sort of mindset, that solving 65% of our link rot problems is a lot better than solving 0% of them. I should also acknowledge that some of the cases where Internet Archive failed to find a page included things like my author had linked to YouTube videos that had been taken down for copyright infringement. One of his URLs had a major typo in it. It is possible that some URLs deserve not to persist into the future. <laughs> the process of using time travel to find the archives was a bit slow and manual, but the fact that most of the results came from Internet Archive reminded me of Simon's advice that came up in our e-production chat that you can simply prefix URLs with web.archive.org slash web slash to be directed to the Internet Archive version of the page if one exists. So inspired by the automatability of that, I added that prefix to every single URL in my test, hoping that I could then report back to you what fraction of all the websites cited in the book were covered by Internet Archive. Unfortunately, it turns out Internet Archive disallows checking by web bots, so the W3C link checker could not tell me anything about that. So while the degree to which Internet Archive alone will solve all the link rot problems of the publishing industry is left as an exercise to the reader, what I want to say to you is that in the link rot area, it looks to me like there are tools we could be using, some of them quite easily and automatably, and today, to measurably improve the user experience of the hyperlinks in our ebooks. I recently heard Brewster Kale talk about the work he's doing at Internet Archive, and one of his projects right now is making Wikipedia better. As a first phase of that, they started fixing broken links. They've now fixed 10 million broken links on Wikipedia by changing them to links to Internet Archive. So it sort of seems like not shouldering my share to at least try to make an effort at the mere 100,000 old URLs that I estimate are lurking in HMH's backlist. Anyway, now that we've invoked Internet Archive, it is probably time to move on to digital archiving. And I have to say first, as a caveat, this is very much not my field. There's tons of excellent work on principles of archiving, and web archiving in particular, that's relevant here. This will be a very brief summary based on my understanding, but my advice to you, first of all, would be this is not a field you need to reinvent as a publisher. Libraries and archives have been working on this problem for centuries, for literal centuries. This is the Library at Alexandria. It's just that digital publishing now affords us the opportunity to work directly with librarians and archivists instead of their waiting until we die to try to piece our stuff back together. Or, as an archivist I interviewed put it, publishers should hire more library science graduates. So, how does the advent of digital publishing change the ideas of archiving? Traditionally, we think of archives as taking care of things after their use is over. For example, inheriting boxes of someone's papers after they've died. But now that all of us are creating so many digital objects every day, and finding that the old ones are rapidly becoming inaccessible, that we can't read our email archive from 10 years ago, that we can't sell our fixed layout to EPUBs, we have to start thinking, we have to start thinking about preserving things that are still in active use. And because of this change, I think there starts to be an onus on us as publishers, at least if we think our work is important enough to outlast us, to start thinking about creating digital objects that are what archivists would call archive ready. Communities like our e-production community, which have focused on the creation of digital objects, now need to know and to care about the preservation of those objects. And I think, again, this is no different than what we've been talking about, building digital objects to last. We can look to guidelines for building preservable websites, like these ones that were developed by the United States Library of Congress, or tools like archiveready.com that are used to tell if your website is optimally designed for archiving. And if we dig into these Library of Congress website guidelines, what I see is that most of the guidelines are clearly analogous to ways that we can develop ebooks. Use web standards, follow accessibility guidelines, be complete with your navigational aids, and your metadata, do something to address link rot. Some of these things are a little more business model -y, like Make sure DRM is not preventing archives from including your material in the same way that websites should be allowing web crawlers if they want their content to be archived. Make sure that rights issues aren't causing your ebooks to be removed from collections. Maybe let libraries who buy a copy of your ebook keep it forever instead of licensing it to them. And coincidentally, which I strongly believe means not coincidentally at all, you will see that these again match up with what we're already asking you to do for accessibility and semantics and standards. That once again, if you build your ebooks in the right way to open standards and accessibly and semantically, the experience of the web says you will also be making them preservable. That ebooks done right are ebooks that last. If you're interested in these topics, a good reading here is the Digital Preservation Coalition's report on preserving ebooks from 2014, which highlights what they saw as some of the specific concerns around the format and outlining some recommendations for publishers. And the quote here is. Ebook technologies are creating pressures on memory institutions to handle complex new content with multiple technical and legal complications at very large scales, well in advance of any stabilization of standards for formats, for workflows, for tools, or for best practices in contracting with producers of this content. So, yep, 
I think they're on the same page as us. Additionally, I know the BISG, the Book Industry Study Group, is working on a project they call Bookstop Files, which is an initiative to connect scholarly communities with publishing practitioners around digital file archiving practices and recommendations. Their white paper is supposed to be out this fall. So I think the larger book community is starting to think about these archiving issues. Some other considerations for digital archiving that just came up as I was interviewing people on this topic. You could think about, are your ebooks data or art? When we're talking about preserving ebooks, are we talking about just preserving data? Is an ebook just the digitized text and images, and preserving that data as an XML or HTML or EPUB file is all we need? Or do you think of your ebooks more as digital art, where to appreciate the object, you also need to preserve things like the software platform and the rendering engine and the devices that you use to read it, and all the elements of the digital context that it's read in? Is it enough to have a text file with the right words in the right sequence, or do we want to preserve the unique experience of reading the life of Pi on the Microsoft Edge browser on a ThinkPad running Windows 10? I was just last night talking to some of our colleagues here about their own personal museums of obsolete e-readers, but if we think there was something to those early reading experiences, even just some nostalgic reason that you're keeping your first e-reader in the back of your desk, we need to be talking about emulators for the software and rendering engine and devices so we can continue to read those files that we've made exactly the way that you read your first ebook or in the multitudes of ways that people are reading ebooks today. You could think about the necessity of context, that archivists may be interested in your ebooks as complete objects, but they'll also be interested in things like tracking the version history from the manuscript to the page proof to the ebook to the corrected ebook. And they'll be interested in incidental materials, like your email correspondence around the reasoning behind all the corrections you made to version three of the ebook, the things that create a context around the digital files you have saved. And the challenge here when archiving live objects is how can you know what people in the future will find useful or interesting? Which ebook editions are gonna be the important ones? Which Word file is on your desktop right now that someday is gonna be the equivalent of Shakespeare's original manuscript for Hamlet? And in the opposite direction, you can think about your ebooks as apart from context. You could consider what would be involved in making your ebook files usable for what the digital humanities calls non-consumptive reading, having digital versions of your text available as part of a large corpus that can be used for data mining or text analysis or other kinds of machine searching and processing. That may be the future of humanities research. See panel after lunch. You could think about stability of access. A major issue from the library and archive side is that it's very uncommon for ebook licenses to grant permanent possession of an ebook. And if a library or archive does not properly own an ebook, it can't really promise to preserve it or make it accessible to its audiences over the long term. And DRM, of course, DRM is first a technical obstacle in the preservation of ebook files, but also changes in DRM technology are a major thing that can make digital objects instantly inaccessible. We can think about the stability of the content. I think a lot of our publishing companies mostly consider the print book, the canonical version of the text, the real book, what we're gonna check when we're not sure about something that's in the ebook. And in the same way, archivists have some questions about the intellectual status of the ebook. We know that digitization often in introduces errors in a text and that ebooks may be flawed as a result. In that case, is it safe to make the digital version of a text the archival version, especially if we then assume we don't need to also save the print version? And while as publishers, we appreciate that digital content can be changed and even removed from sale and rearranged if need be, I really love the ability to make updates and fixes silently in our eBooks. That lack of content stability, of course, complicates careful archiving. And then technical infrastructure around archiving, I haven't even begun to dig into, but there are a lot of technical standards around how you make sure your digital archives have version control and stay stable and won't be erased by a sudden sun flare. And that's a great reason to partner with an existing library or archive to start archiving eBooks. So for a quick conclusion, we've used a few lenses through which to consider how we would build ebooks that last. We think about why it matters, what gets ebooks suppressed, workflow and design tips, link rot, digital archiving. And again, what has struck me really repeatedly through this research and writing is that the answers to these questions are familiar, that when we ask how to make ebooks that last, we see the answers are the same as those to our other perpetual questions. How do we make standards compliant ebooks? How do we make accessible ebooks? How do we make semantic and cleanly coded ebooks? And I think simply, how do we make good ebooks? Also, don't use drop caps. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I think I've got about five minutes here if there are any questions. Um, so, one, I feel personally attacked by this relatable content, and uh, <laughs> no, but on, in, in all seriousness, like I, I agree with a lot of the points you're making about the things we get suppressed and it's inefficient, but you got to leave all that. So for us who still remain, 
Um, how do you go about telling editorial that fixed layout is temporary when they want the books to match the print as much as possible? Like, what is your advice for <laughs> continuing to uh, take baby steps with people who don't quite understand the, the semantics of ebooks while also not wasting as much time on inefficiencies? Yeah, great questions. I mean, I think the do you want to answer, Lisa? Could you toss it to Lisa? So in my experience, there are a few things you can do there. One is fixed layout should only be used if the art extends to the bleed of the page, which actually is a really good argument for not using it on highly designed. Like every page has to be to the bleed on every page, which means you do kids fi picture books, and you do graphic novels, and you do nothing else is fixed. And <clears throat> when you have a designer or an editor who feel very, very, very strongly, or an author who feels very, very strongly that the design is essential, even though it's really just a blue border around the edge of some pages, you build samples and try to convince them that that is a better reading experience because it can be sold in more places. Because you can reliably sell your Reflow books in those 40 plus retailers, but you cannot reliably sell your fixed page books in all of them. So that helps. Um, and when push comes to shove, you sit down and write the email for the editor to send to the author. Because most <coughs> often when they're fighting on that, it's because they don't know what to say to the author and they just need help with how to word it. That was a beautiful answer. Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> Other questions? My question is, for the audience, how do we live in this world where nothing works? <laughs> We're 30 years into HTML, CSS has been around for 25 years, we're 20 years into ebooks, and the most basic things still don't work. How do we keep going forward? Why, why are we still here and relatively happy? <laughs> Wow, would anyone like to take that one for a day? <laughs> I've, when I was listening to your talk, I was wondering if there will always have to be a role for PDF if it controls all these things and solves all these problems for people who just cannot let go of their design elements for whatever reason. Will there always have to be a role for PDF for people who cannot let go of their design elements for any reason? That's interesting. I didn't consider PDF a lot when uh, preparing this talk, but it is true that at HMH we prepare a shadow PDF version of every single ebook. Every ebook goes out as a PDF as well as an EPUB to certain retailers that only take PDF. And I have to say my team mostly just refuses to acknowledge that those exist. We don't make corrections in the PDFs. We don't listen to comments from those retailers. I have a limited source of knowledge about where we are with PDF. I don't know if anyone else wants to tackle the problem of does the permanent requirement of PDF sort of negate everything we're talking about here anyway? All right, I'm gonna think about that. Can I get back to you? <laughs> 